yeah, I think we can we can actually get started. Um, I will just make a short introduction, and uh, then we can uh, have our speakers present their work. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd like to welcome you all to this panel on digitalization and education. Uh, my name is Lars Ludolf. I'm a labor market economist at the OECD Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions, and Cities. Uh, specifically, I am working on in the uh, Local Employment and Social Innovation Division, a division within the OECD that analyzes trends and uh, developments of local economies and labor markets. The main premise of my division's work is that regions and cities within countries often differ in their industrial structure and the uh, socioeconomic characteristics of uh, the po local population also differs. This is very important because it means that the exposure of regions and cities to global technological progress is very different. It also means, of course, that the ed educational needs of regions are very different. To give you to an example to, to maybe you know make this a little bit more concrete instead of just talking in these in these abstract terms uh, think of a city or a town that hosts companies that are mainly engaged in, in manufacturing for such a place uh, the increasing automation of product production processes uh, naturally poses a little bit of a risk um, to the local to local employment of workers if these are not retrained and upskilled to perform new tasks that require new skills. And these tasks may be digital, maybe managerial, maybe operational. So this is a simple observation that I think all of us can agree on, uh, but it also raises important follow-up questions regarding uh, who is responsible for, for the provision of such training, of such reskilling and, up, uh, reskilling and upskilling. Uh, how do you get modular courses where workers acquire skills recognized by the government and by local employers uh, so that a former manufacturing worker can make a work-to-work -work transition more easily. So these are the kind of questions that we want to tap into a little bit in the debate today. Um, it is not just cities that can benefit from progress in digital schools in, uh, for, for education. Uh, think, for example, of a remote area, and we've heard about the concept of smart villages already a little bit during this conference. Think of a remote region where initial education and adult learning offers are uh, very limited or very, very, were very limited uh, before the rise of the internet. Now, uh, new digital tools can, can allow people to pursue education and acquire skills that would have previously not been possible through traditional education available locally. But again, the question is, how can we make sure that people in remote areas have the digital skills to actually access these new learning opportunities? Just to mention that one of the key motivating factors of the, of the recent EU's uh, Digital Education Action Plan is that even today, 44% of citizens in the EU lack basic digital skills, and, and that number is even higher in Europe's rural areas, where 52% uh, of the population lack these basic um, digital skills. Uh, we will hear today about the concept of smart villages and how that feeds into the question of uh, creating new educational opportunities. Finally, um, apart from these new opportunities uh, for, for place-based educational policy interventions, um, there are also new digital educational tools that open up further opportunities to create more inclusive societies across Europe. So new digital tools that have emerged within the cognitive sciences that can help children with learning disorders to learn faster and more easily, for example. And in one of today's presentations, we will hear about the concept of gamification of education as a new way to improve learning opportunities for children. So with that short introduction, I'm, I'm pleased to be uh, the moderator of today's session on digitalization and education here at the Digital Arts Conference. And uh, before we get started, I've already mentioned this, but just to set out the, the, the very basic rules of this session, um, since we are a small group, um, we are quite free in, in how we communicate. And um, I will simply introduce each of the speakers before they speak. And after their interventions, um, I will have the opportunity, I will give the opportunity to you to ask uh, questions if there are any burning questions that you have. Um, otherwise, we will move on to the next intervention and then have a discussion after we've listened to all these intervention, interventions. But again, since we are a small group, please feel free to ask any questions. Uh, there are no silly questions in this, con in this context, really. 
um, it's, it's all very new to all of us. So um, learning and asking the right questions, or even if you think it's not the right questions, is very important. Okay, with all of this said, um, I want to introduce our first speaker of the day. It's, she's called Angela Catoni. Uh, she's currently a PhD student in the Department of Psychology and Cognitive Science at the University of Trento, where she does research on inno innovative and effective learning methods with a particular focus on the motivational and educational aspects of playful learning and video game activities. Her research focuses on both children with a typical development and children with developmental dyslexia. Uh, next to her PhD studies, Angela also works at Ericsson Publishing House, where she's responsible for the editorial line on professional startups of teachers and clinicians. Um, Angela, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, please feel free to, to give us your insights. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Lars. Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes. OK, perfect. So I'm ready to start. Um, young generation who have grown up in close contact with information technologies since childhood, and even more with video games, uh, require a spur during teaching learning activities in order to keep attention and motivation high. Teachers should try to respond through different teaching strategies to the educational needs of students, as well to increase their involvement in favor of active learning and to foster positive learning experiences. Game, video games, or even just game elements can thus be an important factor to influence the behavior of students to involve them as they provide experiences, perspectives, and feedback to ensure that learners develop both soft skills and content understanding. In this sense, also gamification can support the learning process of students. So gamification refers to the use of game elements in traditionally non-gaming contexts, such as education or rehabilitation. More recently, the definition of gamification significantly evolved, referring to any product, service, system, and activity, both analog and digital, which afford positive experiences as games do. This most recent definition of gamification no longer focuses on elements of game design, since that would suggest that the experience of playing is intrinsic to such elements, rather on the experiential quality of playing, of playing the gameful experience. Gamification is widely used in formal educational contexts, especially in university courses, mainly to increase motivation and participation, as well as to support content learning in specific subject areas. And even at lower grade schools, uh, school grades, uh, uh, gamification finds room for application and its benefits have been analyzed in several studies that showed how gamification has a positive influence, particularly on involvement, motivation, learning outcomes, participation, satisfaction, and fun. There are several studies which showed how the satisfaction of primary psychological needs can be improved by the use of gamification during the learning process. However, there are as many studies in which ambivalent or insignificant effects emerged, since motivational experiences can vary from person to person and have different effects based on the type of user and contextual uh, elements. Nevertheless, the results derived from gamification application in the educational field have proved predominantly positive, with an increase in motivation, commitment, and fun as well as in performance in various didactic activities. In their literature review, Coivisto and Hamari suggested a clear majority of positive findings in educational research. Yet, in another previous review, they also reported that gamification studies in the educational context predominantly focus on quantifiable learning outcomes, for example, grades and test results, when compared to research in other settings, more concentrated on motivational outcomes. The, ludic, the ludic educational design should not only have the aim to improve learning outcomes, but also to offer students effective, fun, uh, and engaging activity uh, and experiences. This is even more true in case of children with special educational needs and uh, specific learning disorders. 
Um, gamification interest increased significantly in recent years since most students with difficulties have demotivated attitude towards school and the educational process in general. They show greater difficulties when learning, they often get bored easily and quickly lose interest in repetitive activities when involved in extracurricular training related to their specific difficulty. They usually have lower level of intrinsic motivation, self-esteem and perception of competence. So this highlights the great need to apply teaching strategies that increase motivation in students with SEN. Uh, given the evidence of how gamification can increase motivation and in students' involvement, special education has begun to integrate the use of mobile devices in the classroom. The use of gamified application and tablets has shown a positive response from students with SEN and reported greater, uh, greater fun in the process of learning. Uh, growing from school to the clinical setting, defining effective interventions is, is an important challenge for research on SLD, specifically in disorders, as the impairments associated with these learning disorders might negatively influence the possibility to develop a good quality of life in a society dominated by the written word and by numbers. Um, a timely intervention is thus fundamental. And in this regard, in the last 10 years, there has been an increasing interest in trying to assess the effects of different methods and tools, such as gamification, also to answer needs for both patients and professionals. Information technology seems to provide multiple opportunities also in the management of rehabilitation exercises, a more attractive work environment for the patient and precision in the presentation of stimuli that often require accurate timing uh, of exposure and the ability to automatically and precisely record the answers provided. So digital systems are adaptive and this feature is especially important on the motivational level as by avoiding the repetitiveness of the stimuli and setting the parameters on the basis of child's real abilities, it is possible to avoid getting used to predefined and predictable pattern, which often ends up boring the child. Digital tools also uh, and the inter internet offer the possibility of remote rehabilitation. Due to the recent Ill health emergency, the traditional rehabilitation setting consisting of one-to-one -one relationship in presence between patient and professional is more and more losing its characteristic of uh, exclusivity in favor of other firms of intervention, uh, less demanding on an economic and organizational level, but not necessarily uh, less effective. Of course, digital environments are not considered alternatives to the more traditional rehabilitation practice, but their intrinsic potential try to overcome some limitations. Um, the professional who uses the digital tools remains fully responsible for the planning and management of the rehabilitation program. And the digital tools can help him and her by providing, for example, updated and automatically managed reports of several patients at the same time, giving the possibility to have an instant view of the entire intervention to monitor progresses with the possibility of mod modifying it on precise uh, data report. So trying to overcome uh, gamification research limits, my PhD research aimed uh, precisely to investigate whether gamification can improve motivation and reading and writing skills in eight to 10 years old children. The design consists in comparing the effects of gamified applications to that of equivalent traditional pen and paper activities in mixed and non-specific school groups. And the effects were compared to those of uh, an individual and clinical treatment for children with specific learning disorders, uh, dis developmental dyslexia and dysautography in particular, using the same gamified uh, applications. So gamification, uh, the, the research objectives were to assess whether gamification can lead to better learning outcomes, given by a significant difference in pre and post training performances. With each, uh, within each condition and by a significant difference between post-training outcome in different experimental conditions, uh, and whether gamification can motivate and involve children efficiently and effectively during the learning activities. 
Consequently, the research consisted of two studies. In the first study, a 12-hour gamified training at school was compared with an equivalent pen and paper training, both aimed at exploring the efficacy of gamified application and traditional activities, purposefully uh, designed to enhance linguistic skills. And the second study, uh, aimed to explore whether improvements after the use of gamified applications differ among children with neurotypical development, children with SLD, children with unspecified neurodevelopmental disorders, and bilingual children. A statistically significant improvement was reported in most of the reading and writing indices after the training sessions within the school sample, regardless of the type of training. The training performed with both applications and textbooks determined an intra-individual improvement in performance uh, at post-training compared to pre-training results for the different indices, with the highest improvement reported for the experimental groups, even though the results not show, did not show a significantly greater effect of gamification on improvements compared to traditional pen and paper training. However, uh, as evidenced by the intra-individual analysis, gamified applications are still a valid tool that can integrate and complement traditional methods. Also, for the group of children with the development of dyslexia and or dysautography, there was a clinically significant improvement in reading fluency and correctness, and an announcement, although not significant, in writing accuracy. The difference between school and clinical training consisted in activities that were the same for everyone within the school group, while they were, they were individualized and personalized for the clinical group. Therefore, an individualized approach and the presence of constant educational support are more effective for the enhancement of these skills. And it can be deduced that children without school difficulties benefit from gamified activities even when they are implemented in the same way for everyone. While for children with greater academic difficulties, there is a need for individualized and personalized uh, uh, programming regarding specific educational needs to make the most uh, the benefits out of gamification. The majority of children reported the highest degree of satisfaction in the use of gamified software compared to traditional pen and paper activities and the general enthusiasm for the proposed activities emerged as they represented a novelty in comparison to more traditional lessons. And such enthusiasm and proactivity remained almost totally unchanged in the experimental groups, whereas in the subjects assigned to the control conditions, the interest in the proposed activities gradually decreased over time. I'm going to, to conclude. Um, the research proved that a gamified training is feasible, both in school and clinical settings. Even at home, considering that some clinical training sessions took place during health emergencies lockdown. Uh, in the classroom, the integration of a more traditional method with a digital one could be promoted and it would allow students to receive immediate and direct uh, feedback on their performance, to have tasks with <clears throat> precise um, objectives, to learn from their mistakes without fear of judgment. As for teachers and professionals, gamified applications could offer an integrative tool, not only to achieve the general learning objects uh, of the entire class group, but also for more specific purposes related to the needs of the individual students or patient by proposing more targeted exercises to consolidate and enhance skills. In addition, professionals will also monitor individuals' progress in real time and continue to review the training program. And it would also have a valid tool for distance teaching and intervention, essential in the current context. In conclusion, uh, it is possible to state that the use of gamification alongside more traditional methodologies and with the specific support can lead to positive improvement effects in learning and motivation for children with the <clears throat> neurotypical development and children diagnosed with SLD. And this can foster study, uh, future studies investigating the effects of gamified application on other skills and other motivational aspects. And the hope is that the shared evidence-based practice can enhance professional work and children's learning performances and motivation. Thank you. We cannot hear you, Lars. Okay, I think I think you can hear me now. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm still learning uh, the digital tools here, um, as you can see. Um, thanks a lot, Angela, for these insights into your into your research. 
Um, I said at the beginning that there are no silly questions on this topic, so I will go ahead and ask one uh, immediately myself. Um, could you maybe, for, for us who are not that familiar with the approach of gamified learning, uh, give us an example just to illustrate um, what exactly we should imagine when you say gamified learning, and um, maybe also tell us, like in this context, uh, what exactly it is that you think that children with a, with a learning disorder could potentially take away from it that they can't take away from from traditional learning methods. Mm -hmm. uh, just briefly, but I think that's important so, so everyone here can, can walk out and, and know what exactly we were talking about. Thank you, Angela. Uh, if there would be time, if there, um, there was time, I would be glad to uh, show you also the gamified applications that I use because I have uh, installed on my PC, but I'm just briefly uh, descri <clears throat> describing them. Basically, gamif gamified applications, uh, well, we use the uh, gamified application aimed at uh, announcing uh, um, linguistic skills. But uh, with gamified applications, you can think uh, about also uh, apps we use every day. Uh, because if you think about uh, um, um, running or even uh, walking applications in which there are trophies, uh, there are achievements, there are uh, feedback on your performance, those are all gamified applications. So basically, um, well, there are um, some uh, specific um, elements that characterize gamification, and I have mentioned some of them. Uh, the, the, most, um, the most common and most uh, known that are trophies, uh, when someone gets up perfect performance or a good performance, um, feedback on performance or results, visible results. So with graphs also to monitor one's um, uh, uh, performance uh, over time. Um, feedback uh, about the application itself or in more, um, let's say, uh, motivating uh, uh, systems, a guiding character uh who speaks <laughs> directly with the uh, with the user uh to motivate him um and to immerse uh, him uh, more deeply into the application uh can give and so on. these are basically the the, the, the most known uh, also the lead the leaderboards the leaderboards uh among uh, um gamified uh online gamified applications uh, in which you can compare your performance with the, the one of others so these are basically the the, the elements uh, so whatever activity you do with that gamified application be it uh, um um, word puzzle to announce your linguistic skill or um, some QI uh, brain testing. Uh, uh, that's uh, basically what gamification do. Keep your motivation to uh, go on high. And for children, uh, what they can take from it. Uh, well, basically, uh, with the applications we use, the, the uh, program, uh, I mean the the um, the subject program, the activity program was the same of the program that uh, you can also give to them in a more traditional way. So learning about syllables, learning about uh, correct orthography, so the written word. So the the content were the same. Uh, what differed was the activity itself. So compared to an activity in which you have uh, a paper sheet in which you have to answer in which to have you write down the your answers uh you have a tablet in front of you and we know that uh, the, the mobile device uh, also at home uh, is a uh, an object that children <laughs> want to use want to use and uh, you have colorful stimuli audio and video feedback. Uh, so it, it's the learning environment that is enhanced, but the content remains the same. Great, uh, thanks a lot, Angela, for this, for this clarification. I, I think it was important just so, so everyone's on the, on the same page and, and understands what exactly we are talking about here. 
Uh, thank welcome. you so much. Thank you so much, Angela, for these for these insights. And uh, with that, I will uh, pass on the floor to Simone. Simone Gavaioli uh, is currently Director of Strategic Partnerships at Digitary, a leading global credential, credentialing platform in higher education. He co-founded and chaired the EAIE Digital Student Data Portability Task Force initiative, which then seeded the creation of the Groningen Declaration Network. Um, Simone, you will have to uh, say a few words about what, what these networks are. Um, for this role, he was presented with, a, with the EAIE Rising Star Award in 2011. Um, Simone also is an expert on inaugural EU blockchain observatory and is a current member of the ESCO Maintenance Committee. In 2021, so last year, he co-started a new international network called Micro Credentials Sans Frontières, an open community to discuss issues and curate research around micro credentials, which I believe will be his main talking point today. Uh, Simone, uh, it's, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lars, and um, I apologize for the long bio. Uh, I'd say this is a case of um, credentialism uh, versus credentialing, where credentialism is more on the <laughs> sort of negative end of the spectrum, where you accumulate too much. But that's just the nature of, I guess, my connection with the work that I've been doing uh, for most of my professional life, which is essentially contributing to building out the global credentialing ecosystem across education and work. And mostly the way I express this is through contributing and leading work around interoperability and open standards, technical standards around learner records and digital credentials. So that's a bit another piece summary, let's say, uh, about me. Um, I wanted to thank you, Angela, for um, laying such a fundamental research um, context for this conversation. And I think um, a couple of insights that she, she shared with us are very important and also a great segue for what I also want to share uh, with you today. Particularly game theory. Mm. My whole journey around credentialing is rooted into uh, a a recognition technology uh, known as open badges that I guess Tim also will talk about, but uh, the fundamental uh, principles behind uh, powerful recognition technologies are really rooted in game theory. And game theory is also what provides principles uh, for solving human coordination problems at scale, particularly when it comes to public good. And education is a public good. So I think there is really a lot that this research uh, can suggest to us in solving a lot of coordination problems, which um, are very much uh, existent in the uh, learning process. Um, engagement being one of them. In fact, I'd say that you know, while we talk a lot about the skills gap, and that's probably the most known to all of us, uh, in, a, in a learning scenario or that as, as, an, as what we're trying to solve for, there is a precedent uh, engagement gap. And so if you look at that in, a, in, a sort of, in an imaginary timeline, you want to connect with the learners and solve for the engagement gap. Then you want to teach them once you have their attention and you solve for the skills gap. And the third gap where credentials come into place is the opportunity gap. So credentials should be turned into opportunities, you know, should be uh, useful. Uh, they should be usable and used to achieve something else than just the mere uh, receipt of them. And so these fundamental principles of gamification are just really behind uh, what I would call, I guess, the, the, the ancestor of, or the old gangster of modern recognition technologies or digital credentials, which are open badges. Um, and Angela, again, I'm, I'm so curious to engage more because there is uh, the history of, of open badges really stem out of um, the need for providing um, a more flexible way of recognizing learning, particularly in, in the K-12 um, segment. And open badges were really uh, just the Boy Scouts 
uh, badges, but digital. And they were used very flexibly across the spectrum of learning experiences, uh, very often informal. So badges became a tool that was very fit to, um, for informal recognition of informal learning. And, you know, uh, picture, I guess, the wide spectrum of, of recognition goes from informal recognition of informal learning to formal recognition of formal learning. And uh, this, this last one is represented by, say, um, PhDs, uh, degrees, or, um, you know, high school degrees, the, the very formal and very um, certifiable ones, whereas all other experiential learning activities are on the other end of the spectrum and and we now have technologies and we've had technologies that is flexible and suitable to really represent all this learning that um previously was impossible to manifest it was invisible and so we now have tools and technologies that really allow us to make the invisible manifest uh, which is very important when we want to represent ourselves online, particularly our digital identities. So, you know, we are more than, than just our grades, uh, in a sense. And I think we now have um, the possibilities to really represent all the learning experiences that we've done. You know, some may call them um, low stakes uh, uh, learning experiences, but they are still very important for the person um, that has uh, gone through them and they may be uh, meaningful for third parties that are, are that want to verify them. I think so digital credentials in particular open badges have always had a very tight relationship with this idea of gamification and and this is something that doesn't just belong to the research or the past. Um, it is a way forward. I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry that I couldn't be in presence in Trieste today, but I'm actually in Milano at another conference, um, which is um, sort of looking at this emergent Web3 space. So just, just you know, for everyone's benefit very quickly, what's Web3? Well, let's start with what is Web1. So Web1 was the first generation of the internet where we could all read from the web. You know, imagine the first browser, you would just log in to, and read through a page, consume content, move on to web two. This is where we have had the possibility to read and write. So uh, blogging platforms, the ability of us being able to be on social network and interact with each other. Now web three is you know, read, write plus own. And so we are solving for this uh, emerging crisis around self sovereignty and, and just control over our personal data. Um, and in, in this Web3 world, when we look at education, we've coined these new terms, which is Ed3. You know, it's Web3 for education. And a lot of the new dynamics that are really enabled by this, this emergent um, underlying technologies, which is more decentralized, you may have heard about the word blockchain, is, is not a techno technological solution, but it, it really enables different behaviors. And a lot of them are really gamified uh, and leading into a uh, very interesting expression of learning uh, that are framed as play to learn or earn to learn. Now, both those um, interesting trajectories of education um, really touch on, again, um, things that Angela shared with us, which are principles of motivation. So how can you, how much ex extrinsic you know, should you be in creating engagement? Meaning, you know, what is the carrot? Like, is the carrot going to drive your behavior or, or how much intrinsic should it be? I mean, is this something that you're doing because it's connected to your principle, your passions? And I guess there's a sweet spot probably in the middle, but credentialing, digital credentials, you know, initially started to drive uh, is from the extrinsic motivation. So you do something, you complete a task, and then I'll award you a token of recognition. So there is a fine balance there, and this is where you know I guess game theory and, and instructional design come into place. Uh, but but there is certainly uh, a, a very strong connotation in in digital education that comes from you know game theory and psychological uh, studies around motivation. In um, I wanted to kind of switch over and take this conversation toward micro credentials, which is. Um, also something that I want to share with you today or some reflections, particularly the relationship between digital credentials and micro-credentials. 
Um, it is the definition of micro credentials, by the way, is still very much in flux. Um, a lot of people are taking a, a, a stab at it, UNESCO, including UNESCO, trying to just shift the conversation to a common definition of micro credentials. But the truth is, um, it's still emerging, and so there is experimentation even in the definition of what micro credentials are across the globe. The good news is that a lot of uh, this conversation are being addressed at the political level, you know, at the technological level, and then also in practice. And so this stack of different layers, you know, of moving us into the future is happening. And, and to some extent, I would argue that micro credentials are really represent a, a, a bit of a renaissance of learning, where you know we are seeing kind of the formal education uh, kind of reconcile itself with online education or shorter form of courses, courses that back in the days were deemed probably uh, of less value. But the signals that we're receiving is that even academia is, is accelerating toward the adoption of micro-credentials as, as a new kind of offering because the segment, I mean, the learners, the, the face of the learners is changed. We no longer have traditional learners, certainly in higher education, so the offering needs to be more vast. And so, you know, micro credentials are shorter form of courses, you know, that have that typically happen online, but not necessarily, and for which you are recognized with a digital credential. So the digital credential is the thing that you get at the end of a learning experience. A micro credential is everything else is, you know, how do you design the course? How do you uh, deliver it? How do you assess it? And, and how do you, you certify? So that is it's a bit my take on, on the relationship. But I think the micro credentials are very important because they take us back to valuing learning experiences that are really that are really happening anywhere. You know, it could be online, offline. It doesn't have to be you know a semester long. It could be just a few hours. But they represent sort of the long tail of our identity or our learning, uh, which, as you know, I think we probably all agree now, has become a timeless pursuit. And so, how do you turn? How do you make something lifelong? you need to make it a bit more fun and engaging. And so the trick is probably trying to turn learning into more of a lifestyle rather than something that you do at some point in life. And to do that, you need to make it fun, a bit more fun or gamified in a sense. So those techniques are very important. Now we just really take uh, or expand across, you know, a, a, a time of learning, um, whether it's in the physical space or in the digital space. And so I think finally, we're looking at a situation where the recognition of any kind of learning experience is, uh, has been validated. The micro-credentials are sort of that um, tip of the iceberg that is now becoming more and more visible and it's here to stay. And it's not something that happens inside the university walls or in schools. In fact, there there's been pressure from the labor market for employers to provide their own training. And that has created an interesting, I guess, upward positive uh, externalities effect um, that are making the, the new digital learning uh, uh, regenerative in a sense, which is a very good thing. And, and I wanted to kind of uh, close at least, you know, this, this first contribution with um, a quote that has been very influential in my own uh, path um, that says that recognition precedes cognition. And this is a quote by um, Axel Honneth. And it, it carries a message that you know, we, are, we all have the superpower of recognizing um, something to someone else. So if you play the guitar and I hear it sounds good, I can tell you you're good and I can you know, give you a token of recognition. And in a sense, that is a micro credential. That is an act of empowering someone that has done something. You recognize the individual for that. And so there is, again, a psychological very a deep meaning in that and that's why we, we should explore the wider spectrum of recognition not just the formal certifications but the informal the certification or recognition of any kind of learning um, and you don't need to be schooled or learn to recognize something that you see or feel it's good and those uh, recognition points those the data points if we talk about it in digital terms are becoming more and more abundant and they, they start to form a sort of a reputation layer that sits under the credentials and that provides 
a, a signal of performance, which is saying, can you act out on the skills that you claim you have, even if they're verifiable and they're in your digital wallet? I guess more and more, you know, although the data is, ab is abundant, it's also noisy. So the work is, can we bring in the endorsements on LinkedIn, the likes on Facebook, the praises on other platforms, the upvotes, and connect it to a credential? I think that is that becomes a more rich signal that we can use uh, also in assessing and, and, and evaluating uh, learning in the dig digital space. And, and I guess again, I mentioned open badges, but I'll let uh, you know, get team talk more about that particular uh, particular project that probably embodies some of the things that I said. Um, so Lars, um, I'll kind of pass it back to you if you have any uh, questions or anyone else in the panel or in the audience. And thank you very much for the opportunity to share this with you today. Thanks a lot, uh, Simone. That, that was very insightful. And um, last time I didn't really give anyone the chance to ask any questions. So if you have any questions at the moment, uh, feel free to ask also from the other panelists. Um, otherwise, uh, I think uh, Tim will have a lot to say about this topic as well. Um, and uh, Simone, I just wanted to follow up on, on one thing you said about um, employers. Since as a, as a labor market economist, you know, one of the key problems with these kind of micro credentials and digital badges is that um, we have to kind of get employers to actually recognize them, right? I mean, and and not just your local employers, but also really employers across basically the whole country and the whole of Europe. Um, how do we move into that direction? I mean, I know that is a, it's a difficult question, but where do you see this heading? How can we get employers to accept that people have to continuously learn and that they will get credentials for that, that they can then actually use to also, you know, make the transition from into another job? Uh, because if you learn in your own uh, company, um, of course, maybe your employer will recognize this, but then you move somewhere else and then uh, you have a hard time proving that you've actually learned something. Uh, can you maybe just give us your thoughts briefly on that before we move on to Tim? Thank you, Simone. I'll try. There's a lot to unpack and you actually touched on some key issues, but um, I think it's counterintuitive, but um, the, the positive pressure of the labor market on education has been felt and it's moved the needle. You know, it's disrupted uh learning in a sense and and a lot of the learning and development that has, has started to happen inside that was already happening inside um, corporations because maybe they were unhappy with the level of proficiency coming out of schools has put pressure on the academic system and and micro credential is an expression of that but employers were the first one to offer micro credentials call them learning and development uh and they started to take on like each university's lunch you know, the Googles of the world and so on. But, but the other point is, and so in fact, they contributed to really evolving this. It's not just a threat. I think the, the, the recognition piece uh, is easily solved. I mean, the, the formula is if as an organization, you provide internal learning and development training that you certify, you know, and you should, or micro credential, you should also be accept or recognize incoming um, skills that are you know, the result of similar experiences in other organizations. So if you offer a micro, micro credentials or learning and development short courses, you should also recognize them coming in. That the same goes for universities. There's a lot of rush to, you know, issuing, having offering, learning, training offerings, but recognizing them is also the other part of the equation. Now, just a quickly on, on the issue of portability, that's fundamental. As you said, Lars, you know, what happens, like if I spend 10 years in a, in, in a company, you know, I go through performance reviews and, and learning and development and I upskilled over the course of 10 years. I mean, my profile there as an identity or my credentials is as granular as it gets. When I leave, I go to another company, my file, my position gets turned off. And you know what? Today, that's information about me that you hold. So I could actually request it. But then the challenge is, how do I take this with me? You know, what is the portability of it? And credentialing technologies allow that. So you can actually store all that information, whether our skills profiles or reviews into a digital object an open badge, for example, that you can take with you. And when you move to your next company, just slide in that floppy disk, no longer, but 
that would populate your identity and that becomes sort of this, you know, it supports you. I mean, it's an act of corporate social responsibility or HR open innovation, call it whatever you want. But I think the portability of our identities and, and profiles is important in the world of work as it is in the world of learning if we wanted to split them. But it's certainly even more exacerbated by even this decentralized trend, which is empowering in a sense, but requires us to be more uh, in control of our personal data, identity, and credentials overall. Thank you very much, uh, Simone. I think we could continue this conversation for a long time, but uh, for, for time reasons, I think I will move on to Tim. Tim, you also had a question that you posed in the, in the uh, chat, but um, I think uh, we, you, can, you can leave that question for the end of your own intervention, and then we can get back to Simone and uh, he can then uh, respond to it. Um, Tim, let me, let me uh, briefly introduce yourself before you get started. Uh, so we have Tim Riches with us. He is the co-founder of Navigator, a technology platform and social enterprise that aims to close the gap between learning and work in cities using digital badges, uh, labor market data, and learning pathways. Before founding Navigator, Tim spearheaded the adoption of open badges in the UK with the Mozilla Firefox Foundation and helped organizations move from paper-based certificates to issuing open badges for their qualifications and accredited programs. So uh, Tim, the, the floor is yours and uh, happy to learn more about this. Thanks Lars and thank you Simone as well for inviting me to the conference as well. It's really a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, a place-based initiative. Uh, it's called Cities of Learning. Um, it was launched in 2016 in the UK, inspired by the USA's Cities of Learning program, uh, which used open badges to connect people to learning opportunities which uh, appeal to their interest in cities. So we've taken that project and sort of created our own version in the UK. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about the project and some of the lessons that we've learned along the way. Uh, even though we've been running the project for five years ago, it feels like we're kind of at the beginning, but it's an exciting time um, as well. Um, so just before I dive in, in terms of some context, I think we are facing some huge challenges in society and education today. Firstly, as Lars mentioned at the beginning, um, labour market insights are showing us that we need a more agile workforce to be able to respond to the needs of the of employers. Uh, so changes that have been driven by artificial intelligence, by digitization, um, and we need a workforce that can respond to the needs of local economies. Um, we also need to address uh, some really deep-seated inequalities in cities as well, and certainly in the UK, if you're from a low-income family, um, you have a 50% chance of leaving just with no qualifications at level two at all. So at 16 years old, we're telling people that they've not succeeded at all, that they failed in the education system. And we also, I think, need to develop the capacity as a society to respond to global challenges as well. So we need to develop a broader skill set that's not just about qualifications, um, as Simone was just saying, uh, but it helps people develop the capacities that they're going to need, the resilience, innovation and collaborative skills in order to address those challenges. And all of that in the UK is against the background. Um, I'm not sure if that's the same internationally, but certainly in the UK against the background of more and more focus on qualifications and standardization um, rather than this broader approach to learning. Um, so these aren't small problems, um, as we know. Uh, there's two projects that really inspired us. As I was saying, Cities of Learning in the States was one. The other actually was the OECD's Learning Compass which talked about shifting the focus from a top-down system to one where individuals have agency in their own learning, uh, which I think is, is, is really key. So to respond to these challenges, there are three things that I believe we need to do. The first is just to make learning more visible. And this is a, a cultural challenge as well as a technology challenge. Um, but first of all, we think that by making all the points of learning across a city visible, we can start to empower learners to be able to discover and engage with learning in their local communities because learning today happens everywhere as Mozilla used to say so we just need a practical way to make that learning make it um, um, recognized and visible to learners the second is to make it more measurable so measurable in terms of helping learners see the progress that they're having towards a goal 
um, but measurable in terms of demonstrating learning impact because we know that the society we live in today is very much about measuring impact and being able to demonstrate that um, uh, that we've had an impact in places or in communities. And we also want to give people a new currency that just goes beyond exams to showcase their talent. The third thing we need to do is make learning more connected. And as Simone was saying, uh, one of the questions as well was pointing towards, you know, we need to connect this learning through to real opportunities for individuals um, and help people understand the skills gaps which stand between them and their ambitions. So these are the three main aims that we're taking on, making learning more visible, measurable and connected. Um, so as an organisation, really that aligns with our, our mission in terms of really it's quite simple we're connecting individuals to learning and work using digital badges and labor market uh, insights um, and why badges i think i'll just just sort of just to give us a little bit of context just to go back a, a bit as uh simone was saying you know digital badges aren't new they're not a new technology they've been around for a long time and in 2016 uh, we worked with an organization called city and guilds group who are an old qualifications uh, organization they're 150 years old but they recognized that the world was changing they needed to respond to the needs of an agile workforce and qualifications just can't do that because they're not flexible enough and they're hard to change and they're slow so on the one hand then the badges are designed so qualifications are designed for a really predictable and standardized world and that's good and we will always need qualifications but the trust is based on a top-down approach on the other hand badges and pathways are designed for lifelong learning uh, and to recognize all of learning experiences from things that happen in a non-formal setting all the way through to qualifications and trust with badges and pathways isn't based on top down it's based on a distributed uh, system of trust as well um, so that's why we're looking at badges and qualifications so in terms of applying those technologies into a city-based context we started off by asking learners how they wanted to discover learning and it's interesting that even in this digital world people still find learners still find adults and young people um, that place is really important in terms of where they access learning it's important in terms of family and friendship connections as well um, and they wanted to be able to discover learning that was close by um, and have an easy way to do that so one of the first things we did is to take digital credentials and the open badges standards and put location information into those badges uh, and build a responsive web app so that people could switch the web app on and they could find learning that was just on their doorstep. So finding local learning was really important. The second thing we learned is that people needed a way to categorize learning so they knew what type of learning they were getting involved with as an individual what type of commitment it was going to require and so we structured learning into four different layers uh, the first was engagement so that could be a career fair or an open day the second is participate that's when you're getting involved in a course or a workshop so you're really diving deep into learning and then the third which i think is the most exciting element is demonstrating learning so this is where you're demonstrating learning through a project um, and you're then displaying that project and sharing it and working in teams to be able to create it and that's really where some interesting metacognitive skills have been developed the kind of skills that people need to become lifelong learners the third lesson that we learned is that people want credentials with currency and um, you were asking before about you know this the, the the currency with employers and one of the issues that we found is that we want to connect people to opportunities for employment but one of the issues we have is that um, badges um, digital credentials courses uh, and employers job adverts all describe skills in different ways so when it comes to skills we're all speaking a different language so we went on the search for an underlying framework that could help us or an underlying language that could help us connect learning to jobs. And we came across the energy burning glass um, uh, technology, which is uh, based on, it's a library, an open source library of skills, which is based on 2 billion data points, which have been analyzed across CVs, job courses, uh, and um, job adverts themselves. 
So how would that work in practice? This is an example we've built with Southampton. Um, so this is Claire, she's 19. Um, she works in Primark. I'm not sure if you have Primark in Europe, but uh, or maybe we adopted it from you guys. Um, but she's developed uh, customer service skills. She's then uh, gone to a club where she's been recognized for photography skills. And in her spare time, she's been selling vintage clothes on Depop. Now, each of these digital credentials which have been created use this common skills language. So they help Claire to realize that she's qualified for a job that she wouldn't have realized otherwise. So using that common skills language, we can connect together her experience in the workplace, uh, in clubs, and the work that she's doing in her spare time as well. And all of that together helps her to access learning opportunities and employment opportunities, which she didn't realize that she could before. Or to look at it another way, as people explore their interests and skills in a the city, they start to see the need, which is communicated by employers. Um, education providers can check that their programs align with the needs of the labor market. This develops a culture of lifelong learning. And then through digital credentials, we can also demonstrate a return on investment for the city and for employers. Uh, and that helps communities to prosper. Um, the program isn't just to connect people to work though. Um, we're also working with Open University to connect people from non-formal learning opportunities to badged online courses, and then perhaps even through to degrees with the Open University, and it's the largest uh, university in the UK. So it is about employment and connecting to employment, but also about connecting to learning. Um, one thing I haven't mentioned is the importance of leadership in all of this, because the technology is exciting and it's starting to mature, but without engaging with place-based um, stakeholders, this technology will never work and it will never embed itself. So part of the program is digital badging, another is the labour market insights, another is pathways, but the leadership element of the program, which is led by the Royal Society of the Arts in the UK, uh, is really key. So I think there's lots of potential. Um, it, the technology kind of doesn't feel like rocket science anymore. It feels like it, it, it's really uh, maturing now. And we hope that by bringing these things together, we will help cities to respond to the needs of an ever-changing marketplace, help to tackle some of those long-standing inequalities and help people develop the skills that they need to respond to global challenges like the climate emergency. In terms of our impact figures, um, we've reached seven places so far in the UK where they're starting to adopt the model. 143 organisations have started badging and recognising learning and 6,800 young people and adults have engaged with the programme. So hopefully that's been useful. It's given you an insight into the programme in the UK. Um, and if you're interested in finding out more, you know, please do get in contact and um, we're interested in, in talking and, and, and any questions do, do um, do uh, post them. Thanks, Lars. Uh, really insightful. And, and actually, um, you know, some people here in the room uh, took some pictures of your presentation. So I was wondering if, if you can uh, maybe send it to me and, and I can uh, share it with, with uh, people here in the audience so they can, uh, you know, distribute it within their organizations and, and can get in touch with you on, on any of the questions, if that's okay with you. Um, obviously, also um, votes for all the other speakers who have uh, presentations. Feel free to send them to me, and I will um, I will uh, share them with uh, the the people present here, and so they can get in touch with you. Um, there is um, Tim. I'm 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 a bit uh, well. I I I found this all super interesting, and I have a lot of follow up questions, especially on your work with burning glass data. I um, personally use that almost every day in my work at the OECD ah, at the moment. Okay. Uh, so, so it would be great to keep in touch on that. Um, the issue is that we only have 15 minutes left and we need to finish at 10.45 sharp. And I really want to give Jorge the opportunity to present his work as well. Um, so unfortunately, we need to keep that uh, in the back of our minds for now. And um, then uh, later on, if, if people want to get in touch with you or uh, if you are willing to also stay in touch with me, we can, we can discuss this further, if that's Absolutely. okay with you. Thank you, Lars. Great. Uh, thanks, Tim. Um, with that, I want to move on to the last presentation. Again, uh, it's really just for time reasons. I, I would love to discuss this a little bit further. Um, in our last presentation, we want to move the focus a little bit away from these uh, credentials towards uh, challenges in rural areas. 
And uh, for that, we have Dr. Jorge Martinez Gil, um, who is a Spanish born computer scientist working in the data and knowledge engineering field. Um, since his completion, since the completion of his PhD in computer science, he has held uh, numerous research positions in Austria, Germany, and Spain, and he currently works at the Software Competence Center Hagenberg in Austria, where he's involved in several research projects related to knowledge-based technologies. He's also a reader for big data-related subjects at universities of applied sciences in Upper Austria and in Regensburg in Germany. Um, Jorge, I'm very excited to learn more about your work. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lars. It's a pleasure for me to be here today. I would like to share with you my thoughts in digitalization and also in the education uh, in rural communities, smart villages, and so on. For this reason, I wanted to split my presentation into several major parts. First of all, an introduction. What are the problems that they are currently fighting in rural areas, at least in Europe, at European level? Possible solutions, how students can help here, and some conclusions. So, smart villages is now a, a key topic, a hot topic for research at, at the European level, and why? Uh, first of all, a lot of money has been invested in research for smart cities. In smart cities, you now have a lot of systems for uh, controlling traffic, for managing waste, for helping big buildings to save energy, and so on. Uh, and this is possible because there is a lot of data in this environment that you can use for building some solutions based on data, data analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and so on. However, in the world of smart villages, things are very different because in, in villages, uh, you don't have too much data. Of course, you don't have too much data about traffic. You don't have too much data about public buildings, hospitals, schools, and so on. You don't have too much data about waste management, and so on. And the problem is that the villages are facing a very big problem currently and consists of depopulation. Like most of the professional opportunities are in big cities, most of the young people are slowly uh, leaving villages because we will have very small entities where there is no enough people. And when there is no enough people, of course, governments want to cut expenses because public services are very expensive when you are offering just to a very limited number of people. So this is like a vicious cycle that we have to fight against. Otherwise, we will be in troubles in the future. And villages are very important because uh, co helps to cover territory. They have a lot of uh, primary and secondary activities that are very important and so on. So in the frame of a um, project called Smart Villages in the Interreg Alpine Spain program from Interreg Europe, we have developed a digital exchange platform that this is like a IT solution that helps people to be in contact with other people from villages. This is uh, mainly intended for people in the Alpine space. This means Germany, Switzerland, France, Italy, Slovenia, and Austria but everybody is welcome. However, of course, we focus because we were receiving funding from this group of countries. And what we are doing here, you can have access through the website, is, is we are having two major operations here. One is a smartness survey, where the people from villages can assess automatically what is the degree of smartness of their villages. For example, if they have a good internet connection, if they have a very good uh, e-health uh, approaches and so on. Another is called good practices, where it's intended that the people share information about their villages, about the operations that they are currently making in order that all the people from other villages can get some ideas and maybe reuse them for their own villages. Um, I will talk about this uh, a bit uh, later, but First of all, why won't we want to do this? Mostly because European Commission and in general public authorities have realized that the, the population of villages, at least at the European level, will be a problem. First of all, the population, we are suffering a rural exodus in many areas. 
uh, as the young people live also the people who remain in the villages are older uh, the age of the population the average mean of the population in villages is higher and higher it's just a mathematical question if the young people live the remaining will have a higher average mean and this means that it's really expensive to offer them public services like health uh, schools uh, um, libraries and soon public libraries and so on. so we want to try to fight against this so uh, how we want i came from the world of data management data knowledge engineering so we wanted to propose solutions from the point of view of data and what we propose is that we produce contents through our public platform but this content should be always meet three conditions first of all that this is a, a produced using open formats second that uh, it will be matching readable and third that it will be uh, offered to the public with no restrictions or no conditions so the people who are documenting for example good practices they are required to enter into the system uh, several data that will help us to fulfill these three requirements if you are able to do this with open data with uh, matching readable formats and offering with no conditions to the public then you will have a very valuable source of information that can be used for education purposes as i'm going to explain in in the next slide so for example we have two major portals one is smart villages eu and another is smart villages uh, se from slovenia and all the contents that we are producing there we want that this is open format matching readable and uh, public for everybody who want to get access this is our strategy and um, if you do that what could you do well you could involve students for helping you to do a lot of interesting things for example in our platforms not all the data is legit there are people who are just introducing data that this is nonsense or some errors some mistakes and so on and me as a lecturer in the university i'm asking many times to to students in the bachelor's degree oh please create a solution that helps me to detect a data that this is not legit and like them the data are open it's matching readable and is offered without constraint everybody can have access to it and create solutions that will help to do that also another example is to try to detect villages that they are very similar from the point of view of digitalization so like we are fulfilling these three requirements our students can have some uh, mobile applications or some simple software that this is able to calculate how two villages are similar to each other in relation to digitalization efforts so then some public authorities for example the mayor or some stakeholders from the city hall can get in contact get in touch and share experiences and so on so uh, this is our idea i mean i don't we don't have too much time but i will be very happy if you can get uh, this, uh, this this key points from our side we want to have uh, everything documented everything documented in open format in matching readable format and making accessible to the public without restrictions because in this way students and also other people also can be companies small and medium companies or people who in general have a lot of creativity can help us to build solutions that could help somehow to fight against the population of, uh, of villages and rural areas and so on and that's all we think that involving students involving young people who has a lot of knowledge of technologies and access to uh, knowledge for building solutions and so on could do very interesting things in this context and that's all this is what i wanted to to share with you my major thoughts maybe you you have questions or you want to keep on this discussion uh, thank you so much, Roger, and uh, thank you for, so much for for keeping time. I mean that that that's uh, both very uh, insightful and and also helpful. Um, so we have about uh, six minutes left now, and I want to use this opportunity to either have anyone in the audience or or among the panelists ask a question uh, to Roger or make any other burning comments they want to make. Um, 
maybe I can get started because I wanted to uh, quickly ask Jorge uh, to just elaborate a little bit um, how exactly, you know, Jorge, how exactly do you connect uh, to villages in the first place? How do you get people involved? Um, I, from a, from a policy perspective, of course, it's very interesting um, to also understand, is this all self-driven? So are you relying on, you know, young people in villages actually finding your website, actually engaging with you? Or do you have means to connect to people that would then allow you to also include um, remote areas that might not be, you know, uh, self-selecting into your um, um, uh, toolkit and, and website. Uh, maybe you can elaborate briefly on that. Yes, Thank you. In, uh, this uh, platform was built in the context of a project, uh, Smart Villages, funded by Interreg, and we have some budget for uh, dissemination activities and communication activities. So we have newsletters from the mayors, from the city halls that could be interested. Also, like we are partners uh, from many, many different countries, I've mentioned in the Alpine space, and we have test areas that they are implementing some pilot projects in this regard. They are able to communicate with people from this area that could be interested. So we, we have this uh, social network, newsletter, and um, face-to-face -face communication by people from the, these areas that were involved with us in the project. Great, thanks. And, and, and just to give us a, a ballpark figure, how many, how many villages um, do you currently have involved in the project again? Uh, for the good practices we have at this moment, I think 55 or 56 good practices and more than 200 has completed smartness assessment survey. So these are the numbers, but this is open. The platform will keep operating once the project is over. So this can grow and grow. Yeah, I see that. That's uh, that's great. And I and I think I mean you mentioned the the matching of of villages, and I found this uh, super interesting. And I guess um, I mean uh, going forward, you could actually also think about matching villages with with villages that you have, you know, in your own uh, database that are not in your database on based yeah. on characteristics and so on. And I think I would I would find this uh, super exciting because that would also tell you a little bit how to approach um, local authorities in these yeah. villages and so on. Um, yeah, thanks a lot, Jorge. Um, Thank you. <laughs> that's uh, that's super insightful. Uh, Tim, uh, you just posted a, a question in the in the chat. Can you maybe uh, just you know just uh, say it? So because we can't really see it. Yeah, oh, no, sure. no, I see it. Fine. sure, Georgia. Um, I was just wondering if there was a, a web link where we could explore yeah. the project a bit. If you could just put it in the chat, that would be great. Sounds sounds really yeah. fascinating. The work you're doing. I, I, yeah, I'm pasting in the in the chat. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much. And I think uh, there's one question from the audience. One second. Um, no, no, I didn't. I didn't drop out, uh, guys. Don't worry. I just uh, switched off my microphone uh, because uh, someone from the from the audience uh, here here spoke. Um, so basically, uh, just to for the for the speakers, we had uh, uh, two comments. Um, and and sorry, I need to keep this very brief because um, we are now over time. Um, so one comment was on the limits on of gamification. Um, so here, I think Angela already dropped out, but I will pass on your question to her. Um, the, the question was basically on the limits. Uh, so so she said that it's it's obvious that you know it can be applied to to questions about linguistics and and uh, you know skills in that in that domain. But um, how far can we go with that? And and at what point you know um, real world problem can no longer be simulated. In, in, a, in a gaming in a gamified environment. Um, so that was the first comment. Um, if, if one of you has, has very brief thoughts on that. And uh, then your, your second question was on a clarification on sustainable, sorry, what was it? Yeah, uh, the, the, the last question then turned to Jorge. So I, I think the first one, maybe the limits on... Right, right. So um, sorry, I, I just need to need to wrap it up. But but so the first question, maybe Simona, you can uh, um, say just a few like two sentences on the on the limits of gamification, and then uh, Jorge, um, maybe uh, one sentence or two sentences on the uh, limits of um, and sorry, no, on the sustainability of uh, digitalization in in these remote areas. Um, guys, go ahead. So for the gamification part, I think gamification as a word um, is loaded. I'd like to probably refer more to game theory, uh, which have universal principles that can solve coordination problem uh, across any domain. So it's not 
specific to any domain. So I would reframe, I guess, that word. And if you look at the enhancing engagement with uh, subtle um, prompts or recognition, that can really help anyone, you know, kids or adults, progress along a learning trajectory in a way that feels natural and engaging and then uh, rewarding. Okay, uh, thanks, Simone. And uh, Jorge, you have the, the last word of the session. Yeah, regarding sustainability of digitalization efforts in rural areas, uh, we should say that this is a very highly sustainable approach because you can offer the service to f many, many people who are uh, physically placed in different places. Okay, uh, of course, can have an impact if you need to carry, to bring uh, fiber for the internet, but there are other approaches like 5G and so on that don't have a big impact on the environment. So sustainability is one of the advantages of using uh, these new IT approaches into the digital, into the rural communities. We are convinced about that. Thank you very much, Jorge, and uh, thank you very much uh, to all the speakers today. Um, I personally learned a lot. Uh, it's been very useful. Um, again, I want to motivate you, uh, to encourage you to uh, send me your, your presentations uh, so I can share it with the, uh, the members of the audience today. And yeah, again, thank you very much. Uh, it's, been, it's been great. Um, I hope you also all learned a little bit from each other and uh, hopefully you can stay in touch and exchange further on your ideas. Uh, it's, an, it's a very exciting field uh, moving forward. And I'm sure we will all meet each other again at uh, different occasions uh, where we can discuss the progress on your ventures. Uh, thanks a lot, guys. Um, Thank have a good day.